Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Winters, the director of Bing Nursery School, and I want to welcome you tonight to our distinguished lecture. Tonight's title is Curious, Cooperative, and Communicative, How We Learn from Others and Help Others Learn. Tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Hiawan Guan. Dr. Guan is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Stanford University. She has been named as a Richard E. Guggenheim faculty, faculty scholar in 2020 and a David Huntington Dean's faculty scholar in 2019, and currently serves as the director of graduate studies for the Department of Psychology and the Symbolic System Program at Stanford University. Professor Guan received her PhD in Cognitive Science in 2012 from MIT, where she continued as a postdoc before joining Stanford in 2014. Awards and honors include a CDS Steve Resnick Early Career Award in 2022, an APS Janet Spence Award for Transformation, Transformative Early Career Contributions in 2020, the Jacob Early Career Fellowship in 2020, the James S. McDonald Scholarship Award for Human Cognition in 2018, and the APA Dissertation Award in 2014. The Mar Prize, the Best Student Paper in Cognitive Science um, Society in 2010. That's very impressive. Now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Guan. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the introduction and I'll start by just uh, sharing my screen here. Uh, let me know if you can oops, see it okay. And I want to make sure that I can see everyone. Let me bring this up. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen okay. Great. All right. I see many thumbs up. That's wonderful. Okay, so it's so great to have an opportunity to present this work, especially to this audience. I really want to thank Jennifer, Beth, and Jawa, as well as all the teachers at Bing, uh, for making this such a wonderful place, not just for children and uh, families, but also researchers too, and also welcoming for welcoming me to, uh, to give this lecture today. So I'm just going to start by thinking about what does it mean for uh, children and all of us to learn as parents and teachers and researchers, we are all interested in how children learn about the world, but what does learning actually look like. So let's take a look at this video here, maybe some of you have seen this video already, if you haven't now you do. Uh, it's pretty adorable and funny. Uh, I'm happy to share that the, 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 the video can be found on YouTube. Uh, and it's often used as an example of a curious human learner who actively explores the world and generates new data, learns how the world works. Uh, but what is not captured in this field of view are the baby's caregivers and family members who are probably just nearby. And uh, these are the people who created the safe environment with lots and lots of objects to, to explore. And if the baby were ever to put himself in danger, they would come right over, pick him up and tell him not to do it again, right? So what does learning actually look like uh, in our everyday lives? Let's take a look at this video over here. So she just saw a set of blankets that stick to the board, and then she was given a number of other uh, things that are also called blankets. And then see, let's see what she does. here. From less than a minute of a child's play, you find a range of remarkable behaviors that we call part of learning. Oops, oh, uh, I'm going to stop this video. She observes other people and she observes events that happen in the world. She also imitates the adult and she tries to stick the block uh, after seeing the person, uh, adult, uh, sticking the block to the board. Uh, but then she's not just blindly copying, she does so because she generalized what she has seen and she expected the other blocks to stick too. 
And then she explores other blocks when those don't stick. And then she tries all kinds of novel interventions, all the while trying to explain what's going on. And she's communicating that to the adults too. And at some point, she generates a new goal of building a tower with the help of her brother. And all of this is happening in parallel in less than a minute. So just imagine what it means for any given child to be experiencing something like this for a lifetime. So learning does not occur in isolation. As a species, humans have evolved to be with others and evolved with others. And we've lived and survived by cooperating with others and competing with others, and also continuously developing better ways to communicate with other people. And these social demands have really shaped our brains and shaped our minds. And not just as a species, but also as individuals, we're surrounded by other people just from the moment we're born. We observe other people, we interact with them, and we also have created all kinds of cultural institutions to promote and facilitate uh, social learning from the way that we raise our children uh, to how we scale that process up to develop uh, like schools such as the nursery school and educational systems. And, uh, and importantly, uh, we also have universities uh, as well. And so the point here is that we learn a lot from other people. It's clearly important to learn from other people, but still we're far from understanding uh, how the cognitive mechanisms that we have as humans are able to support these rich, complex behaviors, both as learners and as teachers. And that's what our lab is interested in uh, studying uh, at Stanford University. So the question that drives our research is what makes human learning so distinctive and powerful and smart? And if part of the answer is that we learn from other people, what are the basic cognitive capacities that we share as humans that support these processes? So well, where, where I want to start is uh, thinking back to uh, the video that we uh, saw uh, in the very beginning of the talk and what we know about how humans learn uh, in a more broader sense. So for instance, if you think about this baby, if uh, he sees a toy like, like this, he might explore it and eventually might discover that pulling out one part of the tube, let's, uh, for example, makes a funny sound. Uh, and many studies have found that even young children, even infants, uh, they engage in exploratory play, uh, they uh, explore the world around them and uh, learn from self-generated evidence. And a lot of advances in computational cognitive science have allowed us to develop computational models of learning where the learning process can be formalized as probabilistic inferences, where a learner uses observed data, observed evidence to update their prior knowledge. So a lot of these models have been useful for generating scientific theories about how humans learn, not just to children, but humans more broadly. And in particular, through collaborations between computational cognitive science and cognitive development research, including some of the work that I've done as a graduate student, these studies have provided uh, empirical support that these processes not only describe uh, learning in adults, but also in young babies and children. And and indeed, some of you might be uh, familiar with the idea that young children are like scientists who actively explore the world and learn from self-generated data. I see a hand raised here. Uh, I'm happy to take a question. Oh, maybe the hand was a mistake. Any questions? All right, I'll continue. But, well, if you think about the picture here, there's something missing. Anyone venture to speak up or just put it on the chat? What's missing in this picture? I see something on the chat and you can go by. The social aspect, thank you. So yes, and uh, exactly as you said, there's something missing in the picture, which is, well, there's many other people around the baby or the child who might be able to show them things. So the idea that I have uh, for what it means to learn from others is not just blindly copying what others do, but learning from data that's generated by other people. Because a lot of the data, everything that we observe in the world can be data, but some of the most interesting ones and the most useful ones often come from what other people do and what other people say. And the thing is, compared to uh, uh, these data can be generated with different kinds of goals in mind. For instance, a child may be seeing a person just 
incidentally acting without any clear goal, still that may be a useful evidence for learning. Sometimes people might be doing instrumental actions with a self-serving goal. So this green person here may be wanting to play with the toy and activate the toy without any regard uh, to the learner here. And still, if a learner observes that, that would be useful evidence for learning. But something interesting happens uh, when this green person here is really trying to uh, uh, do actions in an instructional way with a communicative goal. That is, a person wants to teach the learner how the toy works, and the person deliberately generates the data for the purpose of helping the learner learn. So when that happens, what the person does is basically what a teacher does, that a person is generating the data to convey what's maximally helpful for the learner to know. And what the learner does is not just absorbing the data, but trying to think about why the teacher is conveying what she's doing and use the data to update their beliefs accordingly. So, um, what I, so the hypothesis that we're trying to convey here uh, is that rather than blindly copying what others do or uh, do what others say or trust what others say, uh, human learners are learning by drawing inferences from observed data. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let me give you an example here. Uh, so let's just think about a, a person, uh, a learner here, who is learning about this particular toy from another person. Uh, here's a video. Hi. Oops. I'm going to show you my toy. This is my toy. Is it? Yeah. yeah. And there's a the ball in there. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you how my toy works, Isaac. Watch this. Did you hear that? Yeah. That's how my toy works. I'll do it again, okay? Okay. Wow. Toy. Isaac, I want you to play with my toy now and see if you can figure out how my toy works, okay? Can you let me know when you're done? Okay, so this person, you might have noticed that the adult describes what she knows, uh, the fact that she knows all about the toy, and she also described what she's trying to do, that she's trying to show the child how the toy works. So she's really making it clear to the child that she's trying to teach and uh, the fact that she's trying to generate evidence in a way that's helpful for the child. So now let's take a look at what the child does. Great. See what's going on here. The child goes on and on, even though there's many other things that the child could do with the toy. Here, the child continues to play with the demonstrated part for several minutes here. And this is what happens when the adult comes back to ask a few questions about the toy. I'm done. You're done? Okay, great. Can I ask you some questions? Sure thing. Okay. I, I, I'm very smart for a five-year-old. Okay, Isaac. Can you listen to this? Can you show me how to make that noise? Good job. Okay, Isaac. I have another question. Can you watch this? Do you see that? Do you see it light up? Yeah. Can you show me how to make the toy light up? Okay, that's good. So what happened here is that, of course, the child knew how to make the toy squeak because that's what he's done for the last several minutes. But when the uh, teacher uh, shows that there's something else that the toy can do, the child hasn't, doesn't know how to do it because he never explored the toy. He didn't actually learn how the, uh, how the light part works. So the, in this study, uh, what we have done uh, is to show children these kinds of toys in two different conditions. One is the one that you saw just here. Uh, uh, the, teacher, the speaker part of the toy was demonstrated by a teacher who already knows how it works and she demonstrated it for the child. But in fact, the toy had several other parts that, parts that were equally interesting. And uh, the question is how many of these uh, uh, the child was able to, uh, to discover.
And uh, what we have found in this particular condition is that, as you have seen, of course, that uh, was uh, a one um, extreme example, but the child children typically uh, focus on uh, exploring the demonstrated part of the toy rather than exploring the other parts of the toy, uh, resulting in not as many parts that were discovered over the course of the play. However, uh, when children see pretty similar things, uh, but from a person who claims to not know anything about the toy, she just found the toy and she ac accidentally uh, makes the toy squeak and then the child gets a chance to play with the toy. What we find is that children in these uh, uh, conditions, children are much more broadly exploring the toy and unable to uh, and actually find out more about how, what the toy does. So what is the point that I'm trying to make here? The actual information that children received about the toy is pretty much about the same. They observed the, that if you pull out a tube from the part of the toy, the toy makes a squeak sound. The thing is, in the uh, condition uh, uh, in the in the in the condition where the ch child learned from a teacher, uh, the teacher never said anything about what else the toy could do. Uh, and given how the toy looks, it's reasonable to assume that it does a number of things. And and of course, uh, as you see on the right side, the children are curious about the toy, and they're uh, and it's totally reasonable to explore the toy broadly. However, in the, in the condition where children learn from a teacher, to the extent that children are expecting a person who knows about something and wants to teach, uh, then children should expect that a teacher communicated everything about the toy uh, and the toy shouldn't have other functions. So even though this child here didn't discover as many things about the toy, actually the child did so for a good reason. It's just that this particular adult here who claimed to know about the toy didn't teach everything about the toy. So the, 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 the broader idea here is that what children are doing uh, in these conditions is not, they're not just imitating others' actions. Uh, if they imitated, they would have done pretty, pretty much the same thing regardless of the condition. But what they do is to think about why the person generated the data. Was it accidental versus was it pedagogical? Was the person trying to show me how the toy works? And depending on the intention of the teacher and the knowledge of the teacher, they draw different inferences about what the toy do and in a way that uh, modulates and influences the way they explore the toy. And uh, this kind of sensitivity, uh, whoops, sorry about that. What happened here? And this kind of sensitivity emer emerges really early in life. Uh, uh, some other studies we've done uh, have been showing that even young infants are able to use statistical information about how the data were generated, whether a person generated the data intentionally versus randomly, and they can use this to infer uh, hidden object uh, features. For instance, if, imagine someone shows you a box full of blue and yellow toys, and she casually reaches in and takes out three blue toys. And you learn that all of these, uh, each one of these three toys make a squeaky sound. And now she grabs a yellow toy and hands it over to you. Uh, would, you would you think that this one also squeaks? Or do you think it does, does not squeak at all? So if the box looks like this, and uh, the three toys came out from a box that looks like this, this really doesn't tell you a lot about how the person was generating the toys. Maybe the person was selectively trying to grab just the blue ones, or maybe the person was randomly selecting. Well, they all come from the same box, they look similar, so there's no reason to believe that she selectively chose the blue toys. Uh, so what children do, uh, even infants in, these, uh, in this case is that children try to squeeze the toy to try to see if, it, uh, if the toy squeaks. However, if the same set of toys came from a box that looks like this, now it's really clear that the person was trying to selectively grab just the blue ones, presumably because she wants to draw the blue ones only, probably because she knows that only the blue ones squeak and the yellow ones do not. And what we see in these conditions is that children, even though they saw the three blue toys that squeak, they don't think the yellow one does and they uh, infer different properties about the yellow toy uh, compared to the other condition. So everything was the same except for the population uh, where the three, three toys were drawn from, and nonetheless they're able to draw different inferences depending on uh, the context. 
Now, uh, uh, these two studies were uh, focusing on children as learners, but other studies from my lab have explored children's abilities as teachers themselves. So even though we tend to think that teaching requires a lot of, a lot of expertise, and to some extent it's true, there's a reason why teachers are thing are so amazing and that everyone can are experts at teaching. However, we were trying to see whether even young children have a basic understanding of what goes uh, into the green box here. That is, can they understand that what, uh, what it means to teach is to generate data in a way that's helpful for the learner to know. So imagine this kind of toy here. It's a toy with uh, 20 buttons and all, the buttons all look identical. Actually, uh, what these toys do is that these three buttons to, uh, play music when you press them but all of the other buttons do not do anything uh, when, you play, uh, when you press them. Now, what we ask children to do is to teach another learner uh, how the toy works. And the question is, how much information do they provide? Would they press all the buttons painstakingly from the one end to the other, despite the fact that 17 of these buttons don't do anything? Or would they just press one, two, three working buttons and be done with it? Now, what's your intuition? What would you do? Would you press everything or would you press just the ones that work? I've had cases, uh, I've seen parents have different intuitions about uh, what they uh, what uh, they, they should do. And, and, the, and there's no right or wrong answer here. But one of the things we were interested in studying is whether children do different things depending on what the learner already knows. So for instance, if the learner already understands something about similar toys, they've seen another different toy that works slightly differently, but it's still the case that only a few buttons work and the rest do not work, then if the learner already expects this toy to just have a three, uh, just have a few working buttons, then it might suffice to just press three buttons and the learner may end up with a pretty accurate knowledge about the toy because the learner wouldn't generalize from these three toys uh, to the, uh, from these three buttons to the rest of the buttons. However, imagine a learner who doesn't know anything about this toy and it's the first time ever they've seen anything like this. If you just press three buttons and uh, don't say anything else, well, the learner might end up thinking, well, maybe every single button does something like that. And the learner may end up with, a, end up with an inaccurate knowledge about the toy. So in, for a learner who doesn't know anything about the toy, it's actually really important that you show everything and do exhaustive teaching, even though it's very costly. So in some of the work that we've done, uh, we've uh, shown that as teachers, uh, children as young as five uh, can actually decide how much information is necessary uh, for the learner to learn, and they can choose whether to uh, uh, do selective teaching versus, versus exhaustive teaching, depending on what the learner already knows. So, but here's a critical question here. In this toy, uh, children already knew what to teach and they just had to decide how much information to provide. Well, how do we know what to teach in the first place? So imagine uh, you're uh, Tom Hanks and you are stranded on an island and you uh, tried really, really hard. After several days of trying, you finally uh, learned how to make fire. Now, if you run into someone uh, who also doesn't know how to do this, you would really absolutely want to share this knowledge more than anything else, because you know that this other person would also struggle to discover it, but it would be so much easier if this person learned from you how to make fire. So the intuition that we're trying to uh, test here is do children prioritize teaching uh, that maximizes the other person's, the learner's utility? And uh, the, the specific idea here is that, well, if you understand what it means to be a helpful teacher, you should prioritize teaching information that saves others trouble, that is decreasing others' costs, and provide information that benefits others, that is increase the rewards. So uh, the idea uh, has been uh, motivated, motivated by the broader idea that we've been trying to put forward, which, the, which is that humans have the ability to reason about others' uh, others' utilities. And uh, this is work by uh, Sophie Bridgers. Uh, Bing teachers may remember her. She was a student here at Stanford uh, and also a collaborator at Yale, Julian Hara teacher. So let me walk you through a study that we've done here. 
So uh, in our lab, we build many different toys uh, and we've built two toys uh, for the purpose of the uh, study here. One is a toy that looks like this. It's a box with a button on top. If you press the button, the toy makes music. We built another toy that looks similar, but this one had uh, many buttons. And how it works is that you have to press exactly this button and that button at the same time. If you do this, the toy lights up and spins around, which is something that children really enjoy to see. But this is pretty hard to discover because there's lots of buttons and there's many combinations. So uh, this, the top toy is what we call the low reward, low cost toy because music is fun, but not as exciting as the, the cool effect on the other toy. And uh, it's pretty easy to learn. It's low cost uh, for discovery. Uh, the other one is what we call high reward, high cost toy because it's super exciting, uh, also pretty costly to discover how it uh, works. Children, they themselves played with the toy and it actually takes several minutes for them to explore. What's important is that uh, this, we made sure that the, the process of discovery is pretty uh, dull and not very fun. So it was really a cost rather than a reward. So what we did was to uh, present this toy to children. We let them play. Uh, we made sure that they know how to make it go after learning how each one of these toys worked so that they could demonstrate back to us how, they, how it works. Now the critical question was, uh, we told the two children, all right, well, I have a friend who will play with these toys all by herself, and she doesn't know how these toys work at all. Well, but we can teach one of, one of these toys to my friend, but we can only teach one of them. Which toy should I teach my friend? So here, what we were asking children is uh, to make a decision to teach uh, and let the learner explore the other toy. So here, instead of just asking whether children can make uh, reasonable choices, we wanted to make more principled quantitative predictions about children's choices using a computational model, and we wanted to test those predictions. Now, how did we do that? Here's a, a simple equation for making a decision between the two toys uh, based on the relative utilities of teaching one toy and letting uh, the person explore the other one and learn, learn that on, all, all on her own. Now, uh, you don't have to read through the equations, but I just want you to know there's two parts in the equation. The green part, uh, the, the first half is about the learner's expected utilities for uh, being taught about one of these two toys. Uh, so what this means is that the learner will surely reap the reward uh, uh, at a really minimal cost because, well, the learner will get the solution and there's no reason to explore and the uh, cost becomes pretty minimal. The other half of the equation is uh, the learner's expected utilities for exploring the toy on her own and discovering how it works. So in this case, the, uh, the learner need to, uh, need to expend a lot of cost, especially if the discovery cost is high. Uh, and depending on how it works out, the learner may reap the reward or not. So given these two ideas, you can think about whether it's best to teach the top toy versus the bottom toy. Which one would you teach? Would you teach the top one, uh, toy X, or toy Y, the bottom one? Top or bottom? I'm seeing maybe the bottom one. Yes, uh, that's exactly right. Assuming uh, it's not really fun to explore, it's really much more uh, beneficial to teach the bottom one because then the learner will surely learn how to make this great, awesome, fun toy to go without having to expend too much time. And uh, when they get a chance to explore the top one, the learner will uh, also be able to learn that uh, relatively easily. Now, uh, in addition to uh, uh, looking at what children do in this condition, we also gave uh, different groups of children different pairs of toys. So in another condition, what we compared is uh, two toys that were matched in the reward. They both played music, but only different in cost. And in the next uh, set of conditions, we compare the high reward, low cost toy against uh, a low reward, low cost toy, which was uh, matched in terms of the cost, but just different in rewards. And in other conditions, what we did was to increase, in, uh, increase the cost of exploring uh, one of the two toys. 
So now what I'm going to show you is the predictions of the model uh, and uh, as well as what children actually did. So as you can see here, um, the, in the first uh, a pair of toys, as, you, as some of you have already told us, uh, uh, the model predicts that you should be teaching the bottom toy instead of the top one. And uh, as you can see that the model prediction is increasing uh, as, as, the, uh, as the toys at the bottom are increasing in terms of their rewards. Now what I'm going to do is to uh, uh, show the data uh, from children. What we did was to collect uh, groups of children to ask them to make a choice about uh, this decision. And here's so, what we, yes. Sorry, there, there is a question in the chat oh. um, about this um, design. Yes, a dozen top or bottom choice depend on the probabilities. It can't be true uh, that for low probability, the bottom is always the right choice. Yes, and I think uh, what you might mean is uh, the, uh, the probability of uh, the learner being able to discover the toy or not. Yes, so there's a few different parameters in the model. Uh, and uh, what we have done is to uh, assume a particular number here. Uh, however, for low enough probability, the bottom one is always the right choice. Um, Christopher, if you can maybe uh, elaborate on uh, what might you what you might mean by probability, would you elaborate a little bit? So maybe we'll come back to this question at the end. Uh, but assuming that this is the probability of the learner being able to actually discover the toy, because if um, uh, the, the assumption that we had made is that because the cost is really high, uh, the learner may not be able to discover. And even if the learner can discover, it may take a long time and, and, and very, very costly. So if the probability of the reward is low enough, it might not be the right choice. Yes, and uh, again, it may depend on uh, whether the probability is exactly how the probability is described. But I'm hoping that you got the overall intuition that in, in, in general, you uh, want to prioritize teaching something that is harder for another person to discover. So the behavioral data uh, show that uh, these are fairly as consistent with the model predictions, uh, which means that what children are doing is not just choosing uh, what they think is rewarding or always choosing the costly one, but, but what, what they're doing is to try to think about what the learner might do and what the expected utilities of the learner might be and being able to make a decision about that. So what I'm showing you here is the same model predictions and data from children on top. And uh, what we also have done is to see whether different model predictions uh, from a lesion versions of these models might make similar predictions or whether they're insufficient. So what we have done is to knock out different parts of the model. So if, if we consider just the costs, not the rewards, or just the rewards, not the costs, or only consider the first half of the equation or the later half of the equation. Uh, these are not enough to make the, the predictions that are consistent with what children do. Uh, again, what, we, what this means is that children are really considering all, all of these components, uh, including both the cost and the reward uh, for both the chosen toy and the unchosen toy to think about what it, uh, which one is best to teach. So, Children are readily able to think about the cost and the rewards of others' learning, and uh, these uh, results have uh, important implications for how we think about formation and transmission of cultural knowledge. Because learners are able, great at learning and discovery, but they can only discover so much. And while teaching is great as a way to transmit useful information, teachers cannot teach everything. So what we need is a smart prioritization of what needs to be taught. And uh, what we were trying to say uh, through this study is that utility-based reasoning can be a basis for curation of useful knowledge over time. So, so far, what I have shown is uh, that what children are able to do is uh, 
even uh, in the role of the learner, uh, what they're doing is more than imitating other people's actions. Uh, they're engaging in inferential learning based on what other people know and what other people want. And uh, they can also think about what the teacher could have done and draw inferences accordingly. And it's not just that they're learners and not, uh, they become teachers way later in life. As soon as our uh, children are starting to learn, they are also thinking about how they can help others learn. And it's more than just providing new information. What they're doing is inferential teaching based on what others know and want. And they can also reason about what is easy or hard for other people to learn and choose information accordingly. Well, now what I like to do for the uh, second half of the talk is to try to uh, give you uh, a delve, uh, dive deeper into this picture and try to show you how uh, we've been trying to study the curious and communicative and cooperative nature of what children do in these contexts. So uh, the one way in which we've been extending this picture is to think about how uh, we can extend the scope of what we call information in these settings. So this is uh, uh, a line of work led by Young Wu, who is a postdoc shared by uh, uh, working with both Mike Frank uh, in our department as well as uh, in my lab. Uh, the idea here is that, well, children observe other people's responses to events all the time, and they manifest as emotional displays like facial expressions and vocal expressions. And these uh, emotional expressions can actually work as a source of information about the world for children to learn, even though we don't typically think of emotion as a source of information for learning. So just to give you an example here, I'm on Zoom, I have virtual background, so you can't really see what's uh, really around me. But if I were to look to the side and say, whoa, look at that, you may think uh, that, uh, well, what, she, what's over there? What did she see? She must have seen something that uh, made her surprised. And you might be curious to know uh, what uh, I saw over there. So the idea here is that children are able to use other people's emotional expressions, in this particular case, surprise, as an indication of prediction error. And it's not their prediction error, it's my prediction error. And they're using, they're, they might be able to use it as a signal for learning. So this is a study uh, that's been run at Bing. Uh, one, uh, this is one study. Uh, and in, in this study, what we did is to first uh, have the experimenter play with the child and, and discover this really cool function on top of the toy. There's a very clear, obvious button on top of the toy. And if you press it, uh, the toy lights up and it's pretty cool. And then uh, what, uh, let's see what happens. Hey, Taylor. You remember that we have some people to do today? Oh, you're right. I'm sorry, I forgot. Well, maybe I can finish up playing with this toy, and then I can help you with paperwork over there. Does that sound okay? Yes. Okay. All right. I think I really like this toy. I really like playing with it. <gasps> That's so cool. Would you like to turn to play? Okay. When you're doing paperwork over there, you let me know when you're done playing, okay? And the child explores the toy. What was so cool? And the child says, what was so cool? Uh, so what you might, uh, what you're noticing here is that the child was trying to look for the thing that the person must have found because he knew, well, it can't be the thing that uh, we just played together because she was surprised and, and it cannot be uh, the thing that we just found together. So there must be something else that the toy does. So he was going all over the toy to try to figure out what it might be. So what we have done in this study uh, is, is uh, this is just one of the conditions that we call the common ground condition, because the experimenter and the child shared in their common ground a knowledge about this obvious function. So in this case, uh, what uh, children might infer based on uh, her surprise is that there must be something else, and the child might explore the toy to see, uh, to find that function. 
And the other case uh, is what uh, is what we call the no common no common ground condition. And what we did is the first part of the study was exactly the same. But remember the person who knocked on the door and was asking about the paperwork. Uh, so in this condition, this person came in and sat in front of the uh, sat in front of the toy, and uh, the original experimenter here uh, went to do the paperwork. And then, critically, this new person did exactly what this other experimenter did. She played with the toy and she was surprised. But because this person doesn't share the common ground with the child about what they had just played before, uh, the, uh, the children's inference uh, should be that, oh, she must have seen the obvious light that we just played with before. So there is no reason to assume that there's other things that the toy can do. So what we predicted across conditions is that children in the left uh, condition, the common ground condition, would be more likely to explore the toy all over as opposed to playing with the obvious function that they already knew about. And that's exactly what we had found uh, across conditions. Children were more likely to explore the toy to find that hidden function when it was the, uh, the original experimenter ex who expressed surprise, as opposed to a new person uh, who expressed surprise. And, um, okay. And then uh, here's another study that it is trying to show the uh, similar idea, but with uh, much younger infants. So. Uh, one of the studies that we have done uh, is, uh, is to show uh, a babies, uh, these are uh, 15, uh, 13 to 18 month old babies, uh, a display that looks like this. So uh, this was a real life experimenter with a big box with full of red and white balls. And what she did, uh, imagine uh, this person takes a ball out from the box without uh, having her eyes open. Uh, so she was closing her eyes and then she randomly draw a ball from this kind of box. Now, if you had to guess uh, what is inside this uh, little box here, uh, which, which, which uh, ball do you think she drew? Do you think she, uh, she would have uh, drawn the red ball or the white ball? Yes, uh, I'm seeing red. Uh, many, uh, many of you are seeing red here. Yes, that's exactly right. Because the box is mostly red balls and just a white, uh, few white balls, uh, the usual assumption is that, well, if she randomly drew, it's much more likely to be red uh, than uh, white. So here in this case, uh, uh, the red one is the expected one, the white one is the unexpected one. And from many uh, studies uh, pr uh, prior to our work, what we know is that when babies see an unexpected outcome, they look longer. So the looking time is longer here. And uh, what we did it was to first replicate this kind of finding, and then we did a small tweak. So after she drew a ball and then put it into the little box, this is what she did. I got one. And I put it in here. Okay, I'm going to take a look first. <gasps> look what I got. So now, what do you think is inside the box? Do you think it's the red one or do you think it's the white one? Yes, I'm seeing white here, and that's exactly right. Uh, what this does is because the person peaked and was surprised at the outcome, even if you don't know what's exactly inside the box, you think that it's something that, you, that would be unexpected to the person. So what happens when you reveal the content of the box is that what was expected becomes now unexpected. What was unexpected now becomes expected. So what we were trying to see uh, is whether infants would actually show an, a reversed pattern of looking time, uh, especially when the person was expressing surprise. And that's exactly what we have found. Uh, instead of looking longer at the unexpected outcome, which is the white ball, uh, infants who saw the persons being surprised actually looked longer at the red ball compared to the white ball. And uh, when the person expressed just a smiling face, a uh, neutral expression, not really surprised at all, what they did was to show the usual pattern of looking time which is longer looking at the unexpected outcome. 
So uh, we replicate the study a few times to see uh, whether the effects are consistent. And we're excited about this finding because uh, it shows that not just older children, but even young infants are able to use other people's emotional expressions, in this case of prize, as a safe signal for learning. And what they can do is to use that as a useful information to make a prediction about what they couldn't see before. So that's one way in which we can extend this picture uh, to see whether it's not just verbal or action uh, as information, but emotional expressions as information too. Now here's another study uh, that is, that's trying to extend the picture in a different kind of way. Uh, that is, a lot of the studies that are that were done in uh, so far has been focused on children's abilities to learn about the world in general. Uh, however, children are also curious about themselves. Uh, and especially curious about what other people think about the self, and they want to tell other people about it. So uh, here, uh, a series of studies done, been, uh, done by Mika Saba, uh, teachers might remember Mika as well. Uh, uh, we were focusing on a set of studies to see how children are able to think about these aspects. So let's take a look at this video here. Uh, uh, the study, the setup was that children were going to play with uh, yellow and green toys that you see over here. And uh, another person, Anne, was going to observe uh, and watch them play. So this is Anne, and you will see her walking into the room. And again, this study was also run at Bing. And you know what? I think Anne's ready to watch us play now. Hey, Anne, is that you? Hi. Hi, Anne. So Ethan and I were just about to play with these toys here. Oh, cool. Wow, these toys are really cool. I've never seen these toys before. I don't know anything about them. I haven't seen these. We've never seen them either. Okay, so you know what, Ethan? I think we're going to play with this toy first, okay? Okay, I knew it because my favorite color is red. Because your favorite color is red? Okay. All right, are you ready to see what this toy can do? Okay. One, two, three, go. Make noise. Wow, that's really cool. That toy makes music. Okay, you know, you can try. One, two, three, go. And the child cannot make the music go. Try again. Okay. One, two, three, go. Okay, see you later. Have fun at that loser. Where's the green one? He's looking for the green one. Oh, that's really cool. It makes music. Okay, now you can try, Ethan. One, two, three. Hmm. Okay, so you know what, Ethan? What? You have to push this button and this button at the exact same time. Okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. I forgot. Cool. He well, forgot. Well, this was the first time he's seen the toys. Later. And now, it leaves the room just before the child finally. Yeah. Okay. One last time. One, two, three. Oh, there you go. Yeah, finally. <laughs> cool. So this is a one of the two conditions that we call the absent condition. What's critical about this uh, uh, study is that the child uh, fails twice uh, while Anne is watching. And of course, children didn't do anything wrong. Uh, we deliberately uh, tricked the child to uh, fail the toy when they try it. And Anne leaves the room before the child succeeds. And what, 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 which means is that uh, Anne leaves the room thinking that the child cannot activate the red toy. And then uh, the child plays with the green toy. This is what we call the unobserved toy because Anne is not inside the room the entire time, but the experience is the same. The child fails twice and then succeeds with the, uh, the third time. And then we make sure that the child can successfully activate both. And then uh, we ask children, well, Anne's going to come uh, back into the room. Which toy do you want to show her? Do you want to show her the green toy or the red toy? And in another group of children were in the present condition. Everything was exactly the same except for the timing of the uh, timing of Anne's uh, departure. So the child succeeds and then uh, Anne leaves, which means that Anne leaves the room thinking that the child can make the toy go. So across, uh, so what we have shown, uh, one, one thing I want to note is that, well, in both conditions, 
children had strong reasons to actually show the green toy instead of the red one, because that's the one that she hasn't seen. She hasn't, uh, she doesn't know how it works. She hasn't seen the child interact with it. Uh, and she hasn't seen the child uh, succeed too. So uh, in the present condition where Anne left the room after seeing the child's success on the red toy, uh, children do show a strong preference for showing the green toy as opposed to the red toy. However, in the absent condition, when she left the room just before the child succeeds at the red toy, children do show a higher tendency to choose the red toy. And we replicated this to, uh, with another group of children. Now you might be wondering, well, are, are, are children in the absent condition just confused and they're just randomly choosing between the two? Or are they torn between the desire to teach her the green toy because she's never seen it versus the desire to show off the fact that they can do it uh, and therefore teach the red toy instead or show the red, red toy instead. So to tease these apart, uh, tease these ex explanations apart, uh, what we have done is to um, uh, tell children and already knows how these both of these toys work so that there's no reason to try to show her the green toy anymore. And the prediction is that in this case, children should now show a higher tendency to show the red toy because they really want to show her off, uh, show off that, hey, I can make it go. And that's actually exactly what we find here. So what does this study show? Uh, children understand, uh, based on what Anne has seen, they understand that Anne can learn about their ability based on the observed data. And when they actually succeed, they can also understand that what Anne knows about them is actually outdated and it's undesirable uh, given what they actually know that they, uh, what, they, uh, that what they can do. So what children are trying to do here is to try to figure out what information can really change what Anne thinks of them. And by showing that, hey, I can make the red toy go, what children can do is to change Anne's belief uh, that uh, he can, uh, to, uh, to, to knowing that he can make it go. So in this study, what we were trying to really show is that children are not only uh, thinking about how to help others learn uh, about the world, but they're also really trying to inform others about the self. And this can, uh, they can also uh, sort of strike the balance between trying to inform others about the self versus informing others about the world, because children also did show a preference for showing in the toy that she doesn't know when they didn't have the desire to show off because Anne already knew that they could make the toy go. So in this case, uh, the child was really sure. There was a clear success and failure, outcome was binary. Uh, however, oftentimes, uh, we, even adults, as well as children, may be unsure about what we can do. Uh, is my study interesting? Is this important? Am I a nice person? Am I a generous person? All these things uh, we may not know clearly, and we may have to learn from other people too. Uh, so uh, even if you may have some clues about it, still there's kinds of things that we just don't know for sure. And in those cases, feedback or input from others is a really important part of what allows us to learn about um, ourselves. But what kinds of feedback do children actually get from their everyday lives? Well, you may give, uh, uh, you may say, wow, that drawing is amazing, regardless of how children actually drew. Uh, well, oftentimes we will uh, uh, tell children, well, well deserved, you studied so hard. Well, the Lego tower you made is just incredible. And uh, as parents, uh, we are always uh, happy to give these encouraging feedback to children. And actually uh, a lot of prior research on praise and actually some of them from Bing from uh, some of our uh, colleagues here in this department, uh, we know that praise can be used as evaluate feedback or encouragement. And actually, depending on whether you're praising effort versus outcome, it can enhance or weaken motivation for learning too. And in fact, more recent research is showing that inflated praise can reduce uh, challenge-seeking behaviors. But the question is, how do we even know whether a praise is genuine or inflated? Because the same praise can mean different things depending on who's saying it to whom. So for instance, you may say, oh, Hyo, hey, that was a great talk. 
but I might have different ideas about what that really means, depending on whether you're uh, on a person who's always praising everything or any talk versus a person who's selectively praising only the talks that you really thought were good. So here we're really trying to ask whether children are able to infer the informativeness of praise given some minimal uh, covariation data. So this is a uh, joint work uh, with Mike uh, Frank as well as Mika Saba and Emily Becker here. So what we did in this study, uh, this study was also run at Bing. Uh, we asked children to draw two different, kind, uh, two different drawings and we put them in separate envelopes so that children could not see uh, the drawing anymore, but this is the drawing that they themselves have made. And then uh, what children did is to watch a video of another child asking two teachers about their drawings. So let's take a look uh, at uh, this teacher here. This teacher is called the teacher Susan, and she's the one that we call the contingent or selective praise teacher. Uh, and the other teacher is named teacher Jane. She's the one uh, that we call the over praise teacher. But of course, children don't know this. They have to figure it out from watching this video. Let's take a look. Hi, Johnny. I'm teacher Susan. It looks like you made some tracings. Yeah, I made these, and I really want to know which ones are good. Okay, let's take a look. I'll give you a sticker if the tracing is good. Let's see. Wow, what a great tracing. Let's see about this one. This one is okay. How about this one? Wow, what a great tracing, too. How about this one? This one is okay. How about this one? This is a great tracing too. Let's see. This one is okay. Thanks for showing me. So uh, here, the, there were three tracings that were clearly good and tra three tracings that were clearly not good. And we made sure that children could tell uh, those, two, uh, those, two, uh, those two kinds of drawings uh, from each other. And here, the selective praise teacher only put stickers on the one that were clearly good, even to children's eyes. And the other teacher, I won't show it for the sake of time, but this over praise teacher actually puts uh, stickers on every single one of them. So the question now is uh, what we ask children after children watch these videos is a question like this. So we uh, uh, took these drawings and then uh, we, uh, we said, remember the tracings that you made earlier in these envelopes? Well, teacher Jane and teacher Susan are right outside and they can tell you what they think. And then the experimenter took the envelopes outside and then left, left the room for 15 seconds or so and then brought it back with uh, one sticker on each one of them. So teacher Susan looked at this tracing and she said, this tracing is great. And teacher Jane looked at this tracing and she said, this one is great. And now you can bring back your best tracing to show your teacher and your friends. Um, and which one do you wanna choose? So here the question is, given that each one of these uh, tracings were in, endorsed by each one of the teachers, which one do they think is really the good one? And what we showed is that uh, children were uh, uh, pref preferentially selecting the one that was praised by the selective praise teacher. However, when we asked children, well, which one is uh, uh, the uh, trying to be nice? The children knew that the over praise teacher was the one who was uh, trying to be nicer. And is it that children are simply tracking the relative frequency of praise and think that whoever who praises less uh, is the more informative teacher? That is not the case. When the selective teacher was actually praising selectively the bad ones, then children uh, did not choose the same tracing here. So what does this study mean? Well, beyond reasoning about what others think about the self, Children are really curious to know how they did and they uh, look for feedback from other people. How did you do? What does your praise mean? And they're not only just taking praise as praise, they're able to distinguish informative versus uninformative feedback, and uh, which means they're learning from uh, others about what kinds of feedback they provide and they use it in order to learn about the self. And they selectively approach different sources uh, depending on what they want. And this is still ongoing study from our lab. I'll try to wrap up in the next just a few minutes. Uh, another way we've been extending this picture of uh, social learning is to extend the notion of what it means to learn from others and to help others learn. Because 
in terms of learning, we're not just learning about the world from others, but we can also use social information to maximize our own gain. So there's been a lot of studies uh, with Natalia Velez, who's also a former PhD student and also run a lot of studies at Bing. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, work on trying to extend the notion of what it means to learn and extending this picture to other contexts. With Sophie Bircher's, uh, you just have seen, uh, we're also extending the notion of what it means to teach because uh, when children are trying to teach, uh, and I'm using scare quotes here because they're not ex exactly understanding what it means to act as a teacher, but they still might have a proto notion of what it means to help other people learn. So a lot of the studies that are ongoing right now is looking at how children are using their intelligence to sol solve other people's problems, even though it may not look like uh, teaching specifically, they're able to help others learn. Uh, so here, uh, uh, just uh, one of the studies uh, that we're running here. Here's two identical looking toys, one working and the other is broken. And here uh, the study is special because the parent is part of the study. Uh, this is run at uh, our partner museum here in Palo Alto. And here's a toddler who really has to use his prior knowledge to figure out what to do. So let's take a look. Hi, Leo. Oh. Oh. I'm gonna try this toy. Can you help me play music? Go ahead, Leo. Could you help your dad play music? So I won't go into the details of the study here, but the point is that this child literally just learned how these toy wo toys work, and he couldn't know which one is the working one and which one is the not working one, and he had to use his prior knowledge to figure out why the, his father is failing, and he had to help. And we have a few different conditions to show that what children are trying to do is to figure out why that person's failing and trying to do things in a uh, trying to show uh, informative evidence in a way that really helps the other person learn. And we're trying to show that the power of human intelligence really comes from our, our ability to figure out how to use our intelligence for ourselves and for others. So. What I hope to have convinced you is that children are neither lone scientists who are just exploring all alone, nor little innovators who are always copying what other people do. What children are doing is to actively acquire and share their knowledge in social context and social learning, uh, even early in life, is curious and communicative and co cooperative. And a lot of the studies we're doing here is really trying to show that nature of human learning that emerges early in life. And then children are not just learning from language and others' actions, but they also can learn from emotional expressions. They're not just learning about the physical world and the social world around them, but they're also trying to learn about the inner world, about themselves, and they rely on other people to give them helpful information, while also trying to figure out who's more informative. And there's also a lot of early merging motivation uh, that helps uh, to help uh, the motivation to help other people uh, lead to informative communication. Because if you didn't care about helping others learn, you wouldn't have the desire to teach or communicate in an informative way. So I want to bring you back to uh, this child over here who was doing all these things in a span of a minute. Children are not just exploring when alone or listening to others uh, when they learn from a teacher, but even in the most mundane parts of their daily lives, when they're just casually interacting with others around them, they're constantly learning about many aspects of the world and about people and about themselves. And, and I feel like parents and teachers know this already, uh, but it's one thing to know this intuitively and another thing to study these behaviors as a discipline of scientific inquiry. And your participation is incredibly important for helping us to learn about how children think and how they grow. So uh, as I close, many of the studies I showed you today have been conducted in Bing. It's a wonderful place. For children who are uh, not students at Bing, we also conduct studies in other ways too. 
One of them is the Palo Alto Junior Museum and Zoo. It's a great place that's partnered with our lab since 2014. And also uh, during the pandemic, we also developed ways to continue our research online using Zoom as well as other online methods so that children and families can safely participate from the comfort of their own home. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, just let us know and reach out. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to thank everyone in my lab, uh, as well as the uh, 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 funder of the studies, as well as uh, Bing Nursery School, uh, really, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, this is the place that really made our all of our studies possible. So uh, I want to uh, extend a heartfelt thank you for all of you, as well as the students in the lab who worked really hard on the studies. So thanks for listening uh, on an evening time, and I'm happy to take a few questions uh, if other uh, um, if other people have questions that I didn't address. Any questions or? Oh, uh, and there was a question earlier on uh, how we can pick the toys at the right level of difficulty and reward to maximize learning for a given age. Uh, I can tell you, at least within the context of this particular study, we had a particular goal to try to tease apart the different predictions that we were making. So at least uh, in the context of the experiment, uh, we, uh, thought about how many button presses would be expected for a given child to uh, explore this on their own. We also piloted, uh, we called it pilot testing. Uh, we pilot tested the toys to see how hard it would be for children to learn about these toys. We also pilot, piloted uh, the relative preferences of children for the music versus the uh, spin uh, light, light of toy. Uh, so we use those as what we call empirical priors to uh, to inform the model predictions that we made. Now, from the broader point of view, uh, if you're thinking about, well, how are we picking toys at the right level of difficulty to maximize learning in our daily lives in the real world? Well, it, uh, what I can say uh, is that somehow uh, probably uh, commercial toy makers actually probably have figured it out uh, in a remarkable way. They know uh, what kind of capacities or motor capacities are a making children able to understand how they find it difficult or hard or how much is costly. Uh, but maybe what I can say here is that it really depends on how children, what children can do at a given age and what they think they can do. And this depends on a, a lot of different factors that we still do not fully understand. So if we're thinking about how to optimize learning in a real world context, I think a lot of uh, teachers and parents intuitively know what would uh, work as too difficult and what kind of toys might be just as easy or just enough. Um, so this is something that we're still trying to uh, understand. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that more studies uh, will help us better understand exactly how children are reasoning about it, as well as what they actually find it hard and easy. Because what children think is hard and what's actually hard may also be two different kinds of things too. Okay, uh, I have another uh, uh, question. How consistent is the same child in their response? Oh, that's a really good question. So over multiple trials. So a lot of the times, uh, because there's many uh, sort of ways in which repeatedly answering a question can bias children's answers, uh, we typically give children only, uh, we don't run children uh, in the same study more than once. What's, what we do know is that it actually depends on multiple different factors. One of them is children are actually pretty savvy about uh, the, the pragmatic implications of being asked the same question twice or more than once. So if you repeatedly ask a child the same question, they usually end up switching the answers because they think, oh, you're asking me again, or you're giving me the same task again, because what I did earlier or what I said earlier is actually the inaccurate answer. So uh, because this can play a role, uh, even though children may have consistent intuitions about what to do in a given context, we typically, for experimental reasons, we don't give them uh, multiple questions uh, in a row, or we don't repeat the questions. 
However, uh, the consistency of the same child in their response to it, these experiments in general, I think it's a really important question because uh, we cannot really make any inferences about a given child for all of, all of the studies that we've done. We only make our generalizations at the group level, but for any parent or for any teacher who's thinking about a given child, uh, how consistent a child's response is something that uh, is really important. And this is something that I hope uh, further research will be able to answer better uh, for, for many different reasons. Uh, at least uh, currently, we're only able to uh, think and uh, draw conclusions about children at a broader, uh, at, a, at a group level. So I'm seeing, do you have um, uh, book recommendations uh, to complement these learnings? There, there's many, many uh, uh, really important and interesting books uh, uh, about how children learn. I think some of the, Alison Gopnik uh, is uh, at UC Berkeley. She's written a number of books for uh, parents and educators alike and the general public uh, more broadly. Uh, she has a book uh, called The Gardener and the Carpenter, basically trying to uh, convey the idea uh, that you can uh, think about early education as uh, uh, what you would do as a carpenter. You're trying to shape uh, what they do and what they learn. Or you can think of it as a gardener uh, providing the, uh, the environment for growing, but you're letting the child grow. Uh, and she has a lot of insightful suggestions and thoughts about our early learning and education more broadly. So maybe that's one book I can recommend, but there's many other books that uh, would be great. Uh, and also it, uh, sort of trying to use is, uh, ins insights from scientific studies to uh, think about learning more broadly. There's another question. Uh, do these uh, findings uh, apply to primary and middle school? Uh, that's uh, how, how can teachers and families apply these findings to primary and middle school? That's a great question too. I think uh, perhaps what, a lot of the, the ideas that we were trying to show uh, in using the studies with preschool age children uh, do uh, probably apply to primary and middle school too. One thing that may be useful to remember is, remember the teacher who uh, showed the pipe toy, uh, the complex looking toy, and then showed the toy squeak? And the teacher actually uh, was a pretty sort of uh, so not, uh, not, not the best teacher that you can think of because this person could have told the child that the toy does other things or at least to point out the possibility that the toy might do other things before letting the child explore. But she didn't say anything. She just said, this is how the toy works and then let the child explore. So one uh, sort of broader implication is that uh, children, uh, not just children, but also uh, in general, even in graduate school too, there's a sense in which uh, you're trying to draw a lot of inferences about why the person said this and drawing further inferences about what other things, uh, what other things this person uh, could have said but did not say. And uh, one maybe suggestion is that if uh, teachers, if teachers can think a little bit further about how the learner might interpret what they had shown or what they have said, they might be able to better uh, sort of foresee where the uh, learner could go wrong. So for instance, if the uh, teacher could see that, oh, if I said this, maybe the learner might uh, uh, inaccurately assume that this is the only thing that the toy can do, the person could have easily, the teacher could have easily said, oh, you know what, the toy might do other things too. So I'm not gonna tell you everything, but why don't you go ahead and explore? So these uh, small uh, comments on the thing that they didn't show, uh, but they could have shown, um, but letting the child explore may be a useful uh, thing uh, that may apply to learning in pre-primary and middle school settings as well. And then uh, let me see. So there is uh, curious if there are good ways to understand uh, kids' self uh, sense of self-efficacy and ways to grow it. Uh, yes, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of studies on how children might be reasoning about self-efficacy based on uh, their own experience, as well as uh, what they see and how they compare to other people. There's uh, decades of studies on, especially in academic context, in, learning, uh, in, uh, in what is motivating children to learn. 
and how they're reasoning about their ability to do things uh, in a way. It, when, when it comes to ways to grow it necessarily, I don't have a great uh, suggestion uh, that I can make off the top of my head, but maybe one way to think about this is that, oh, uh, if you apply this picture of social learning uh, to thinking about ethic self-efficacy, what they're able to do is to not only just learn from their ability to succeed or uh, uh, their previous failures, but they can also make comparisons to what other people can do and if you can think about what others, okay. well, imagine you're, uh, you just failed on a toy uh, that, and you may think that uh, you have failed and you're unable to do this. Now, if another person who you think is much more competent than you are also fails, then this means actually your failure is not something that you can, uh, need to be really disappointed about. And you may be able to make that comparison based on an abstract understanding of what you think about, what you meet, what you understand about my own competence as opposed to other people's competence. And the reverse can be the same too. You may succeed on a thing uh, that, you, that you can be happy about. However, if you realize that everyone else can also succeed, then maybe the success is not the same thing as a success that you have um, that you might have uh, seen uh, when uh, other people around you may not be able to succeed. So the broader implication here is that even young children are able to think and reason about not just the success and failures, not just the outcomes, but something that's like inner quality of other people, like the relative competence, and they're able to reason about these in order to interpret the meaning of success and failures. And this aspect has not been understood as much uh, when we think about self-efficacy uh, and how children are reasoning about these at an early life. Let's see. There's, a, a Chris, uh, there's another question from Christopher. Uh, the last study showed that children are resistant to false praise. We know that adults fail widely in their responses to flattery. Some are highly susceptible and others are resistant. Uh, do you think uh, the almost even split in our study is an early sign of the development of this personality trait? Uh, that's a really uh, insightful uh, point. Uh, the, the, in this particular study on children's responses to praise, Children uh, actually did show a pretty strong preference for uh, the drawing that was endorsed by the selective teacher, and they understood uh, most children that, uh, that the other person is nice. However, the important thing is that not all children show the same response, and there's many ways to interpret it. Uh, one possibility is exactly in the way you say, it is possible that children uh, may already show uh, different uh, individual differences in their susceptibility uh, about praise. However, it's also the case, there's all kinds of things that influence children's choices. Sometimes children say, teacher Susan, because she was wearing a red shirt and that's their favorite color. And sometimes others will choose green because of many other reasons. Maybe their best friend's name is Jane and that's why they prefer the teacher. So from these studies, from any given choice that a child makes, it's really hard to know exactly where that response is coming from. However, assuming that uh, a lot of these uh, sort of idiosyncratic preferences are roughly spread equally across conditions, if they are drawing different decisions or inferences depending on the condition, at least at the group level, we can see that, oh, children are picking up on this aspect that we are trying to study in the study. Uh, in this experiment. So I hope this uh, uh, sort of, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an idea that broadly applies to all of the studies that we run. We can try to read into every single child's response in a given context. However, we just don't have enough data for any given individual child to know exactly what their responses mean. So what we're trying to do uh, is try to think about the broader uh, principles that we can draw from studying many children as a group. Uh, and um, there's a lot of exciting advances in terms of thinking about how we can study individual differences in a better way. Uh, but for now, a lot of the studies I've showed you, uh, we can't draw inferences about a given child or their given personality traits uh, just yet. So thanks for these questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Guan. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk and it's inspirational and learned so much more about your research that you're doing at Bing as well. So it was nice to have sort of that inside look into it. So I, I know we all enjoyed it, especially um, I, I'm all of us. I want to thank, I noticed there's a lot of new parents out there. I noticed there's um, a lot of current parents. And I actually noticed there's a lot of alumni parents here tonight. So there's a, a nice mix of people. And um, I'm sure everyone was very interested in your talk. I did want to say one thing. Um, before we close, is that um, we are just starting to, to open up, you know, a little bit more from the pandemic. And we're just in the process of doing tours for parents. So if you are a new parent or you're on our wait list and you'd like to come for a tour at Bing, we're just starting to open that up. So give us a call and, and we'll set you up on a tour. We'd love to show you the school in person and get to know you. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really wonderful to uh, hear your questions and have a chance to share the work that we do. Especially thank you for uh, the staff at Bing and the teachers at Bing. Uh, it's a wonderful place and I hope um, uh, many, uh, we will be running many other studies yeah. for years to come and learn a lot more about how children learn. Well, we're thrilled you're here and we're, we're thrilled that you're doing work at Bing too. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks for spending <laughs> yeah. your evening with all of us. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Good night, everyone. <laughs>